Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're taking a look at hyper-threading performance, namely how it impacts games. Uh, now the focus will be on the Core i7 range. I don't think there's much of a debate whether or not hyper-threading is useful on a Core i3 processor, as it most certainly is. As many of you guys are probably well aware, the desktop Core i7s, that is to say the sort of the mainstream Core i7s, are quad-core processors. So like the Core i5 processors, they have four physical cores, each with their own independent level 2 cache. Uh, yeah, us Aussies say cache, not cache, so no need to point that out a thousand times in the comments, we get it. <laughs> anyway, the difference between the Core i5 and Core i7 processors is the addition of hyper-threading support. The level 3 cache is also slightly larger, but for gaming this usually doesn't have much of an impact. So, briefly, what is hyper-threading? Essentially, hyper-threading is a technology developed by Intel that allows a single core to act like two separate cores. With hyper-threading, a single core can execute two, rather than one, instructions from the operating system. This boosts efficiency and reduces the delay between executions. In the past, it's been discovered that under certain circumstances, hyper-threading could actually slightly reduce gaming performance. The reason for this being that most games don't use more than one or two cores, and even those that used up to four still couldn't take advantage of hyper-threading. The problem here being, with hyper-threading enabled, the physical cores are at risk of being overworked, while other physical cores weren't being used at all. The operating system was meant to do a better job of balancing low between physical and virtual cores, but this wasn't always the case. Anyway, fast forward to today, and we're starting to find games that are indeed using more cores or threads. Even so, we've been recommending gamers stick with the Core i5 range for now, as it's rare that Core i7 processors will deliver noticeably better performance. More and more you guys are starting to challenge this, saying that you've indeed seen performance gains when upgrading to a Core i7 processor. We mostly believe this to be a placebo effect, though recently we have seen a few games really pushing our Core i7 6700K test machine quite hard, so we've decided to investigate further. The reason gamers worry about their CPU so much is because they don't want to limit their GPU's performance in games. The first reaction when seeing frame dips or any kind of performance drop off is to blame the CPU, and well, sometimes it might be the culprit. So we will be using the Skylake Core i7 6700K processor uh, with a range of newly released titles, mostly 2016 titles, and um, we'll be obviously testing with hyper-threading enabled and disabled. For uh, extreme sort of performance or extreme use case scenario, we'll be using the Titan XP. Um, doesn't really get much faster than one of those suckers. Uh, and for realistic mid-range performance, I think probably the GTX 1070 makes the most sense. Uh, and then for a good sort of mid-range performance, the GTX 1060. So that'll sort of make up the three cards we'll be using. For testing, we will be uh, using the relatively low 1080p resolution, which I know is a bit unrealistic for the 1070 in particular and the Titan XP, not so much the 1060. But we've done this to uh, remove the CPU as the limiting factor or bottleneck, as it's commonly referred to. So with that, let's jump to the benchmarks. First up, we have F1 2016, a racing simulator not really known for its heavy demand on the CPU. That said, the built-in benchmark had our Core i7 6700K with hyper-threading enabled constantly loaded between 50 and 80%. Using the Titan XP, we see that hyper-threading boosted the average frame rate by 11% and the minimums by 15%. Not a huge jump in performance, but a noteworthy increase nonetheless. What was interesting here, however, was as soon as we downgraded the GPU to the GTX 1070, there is zero difference having hyper-threading enabled and disabled. This was also true when using the GTX 1060. Whenever we do a gaming performance type comparison that focuses on CPU performance, Cities Skylines always comes up. That said, in our test using a large, fully developed city with lots going on, the CPU utilization only sat at around 30 to 40 percent on the Core i7 6700K. As a result, disabling hyper-threading had almost no impact on performance, certainly not a noticeable impact anyway. Using our bot benchmark, we have found Overwatch to be very CPU demanding, and the game seems to eat up all available threads. As such, utilization never dipped below 50% and was often found hovering around 70% and at times even exceeded 90%. This enabled hyper-threading to deliver a 24% greater frame rate when using the Titan XP, a very noteworthy gain indeed. However, once we stepped down to the GTX 1070, those gains completely evaporated and now the 6700K can be seen delivering much the same performance with hyper-threading disabled. CPU utilization wasn't very high in Total War Warhammer, 
and with all eight threads available, the 6700K was never taxed by more than about 40%. This meant even when using the Titan XP, disabling hyper-threading had almost no negative impact on performance. Civilization is another game that always comes up when testing CPU performance, though this latest version only pushed the 6700K to around 55-70% to utilization. As a result, hyper-threading offered a very small performance advantage when using the Titan XP and GTX 1070, while performance remained much the same with the GTX 1060. Gears of War 4 is a serious CPU hog, and it's one of those games that sparked the creation of this video. The 6700K with hyper-threading enabled was utilised by as much as 95%, and for the most part, it sat at around 70% in this test. As a result, the minimum frame rate was 38% higher with hyper-threading enabled when using the Titan XP. The minimum frame rate was also 14% greater with hyper-threading enabled when using the GTX 1070. However, by the time we filtered down to the GTX 1060, we find hyper-threading had little to offer. Finally, we have Battlefield 1, another heavy CPU user. For our test, utilization hovered between 60 and 80%, though occasionally did exceed 90%, though only very briefly. Enabling hyper-threading boosted the minimum frame rate when using the Titan XP by 8%, so not a huge gain. Meanwhile, no real gains were seen with the GTX 1070 or 1060 graphics cards. Right, so six of the seven games tested are popular AAA titles released this year, so 2016. Uh, based on the sample of games that we did test, it doesn't really look like much has changed. So at this point, some of you guys may have noticed and may even be a bit disappointed that we didn't include a Core i5 processor in this comparison. We genuinely wanted to avoid complicating things uh, with a Core i5, Core i7 comparison, as this is primarily a look at hyper-threading on the Core i7 processors. That said, uh, you can safely assume that when matched clock for clock with the Core i7 processor, something like the 6600K will deliver pretty much what we saw with hyper-threading disabled. Myself and many others have said for years now that gamers really do reach a point of diminishing returns with Core i7 processors. For example, the 6700K costs a bit over 40% more than the 6600K, and even with the Titan XP handling the rendering, we didn't see those kinds of gains. For these reasons, this is why we recommended the 6600K as the best value CPU for gamers back in our September video. And this is why we also use the 6600K for our $1200 1440p build. So then, unless you're shooting for absolutely maximum performance with high refresh rate monitors and insane GPU configurations, I really don't think uh, a Core i7 processor is warranted, at least over a Core i5. Uh, will this change in the future? Yes, eventually it will, uh, but I don't think that changes anytime soon. We know that for the next generation, Intel's doing much the same. They're peddling their quad cores just as they have uh, for their sort of mainstream high-end options. So I don't think the change is around the corner. With that, I think I'll hand it over to you guys. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. Is the Core i7 worth getting, or do you agree with me and think the Core i5 is more than sufficient for the most part? And if you think this video was useful, consider giving it a big old thumbs up. I'm your host, Steve. Stay classy.